Well, we're not going to delay any longer here. We've got a nice crowd already worked uh, that have already worked their way into the webinar. And so I don't see any reason why we can't get started. I will point out that this is being recorded. And so if you happen to chime into this late or if you know somebody that couldn't be here but wants to see how this all goes, you can uh, share the link with them, which we'll put out once we have that available. So uh, with that, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things, and I'll introduce our panel here this evening. Uh, let me do that first, actually. I'm Nick Pinizzato. I'm the president and CEO of the National Deer Association. I will tell you uh, quite a bit more about what the National Deer Association is here in just a few minutes, uh, but I'm Nick Pinizzato. And then we have also from the National Deer Association, we have Mr. Kip Adams, who is our chief conservation officer. Uh, Kip, you'll hear from Kip this evening. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, already know who Kip is, so uh, glad to have Kip here. And also uh, from the Pennsylvania Game Commission, we have Andrea Corman. She is a CWD biologist, and we've had the pleasure of working with and presenting with Andrea many times on this topic. So uh, matter of fact, we just did six sort of similar meetings earlier this year together. So we're no strangers to doing this, this together. Uh, incidentally, and this may mean something to you, that all three of us are Pennsylvanians. And so even though the National Deer Association is a national organization, uh, I'm coming to you this evening from Indiana County, and uh, Kip Adams is coming to you from Knoxville. Is that Tioga County, Kip? That's Tioga County. You got it, Nick. Yep. And Andrea, are you in, are you in Dauphin County? I'm in Perry County right now. <laughs> Perry County. All right. So there you have it. We've got a good portion of the state covered this evening. So um, anyway, I think that's 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 unique because we're going to have some really local uh, local feel for this. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, before we do that, a couple of housekeeping things. As you have questions this evening, and we will do a question and answer at the end, please put those in the Q&A box, which if you go down to the bottom of your screen, uh, there should be a little box that pops up that says Q&A. Please put your questions in there. If you put the questions in the chat, there's a chance we won't get to them, okay? So the chat is not the place to put your questions. The place, place to put your questions is the Q&A, so please do that. Um, and as I already mentioned, we're already recording this. So uh, with that, I'm actually going to lead us off here this evening before you hear from the others. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And with any luck, I'll be able to do that without uh, sharing the wrong thing. And so, Kip, I'll just ask you for a quick check to let me know that we can see the title slide there. That looks good, Nick. All right. We're off to a good start. I think you're all set. All right. Again, it's good to see everybody here. It's good to have a nice crowd. Uh, we, we don't enjoy talking about chronic wasting disease. Let's get that out on the table first and foremost. And so it takes a little bit of effort to drag yourself to a computer to watch something like this, and I get that, but it is important information, and I think uh, Pennsylvania sportsmen have a lot of questions about CWD, especially as we are uh, in the middle of archery season. Very soon we'll be into the firearm season. As a matter of fact, there's already a, a muzzleloader season going on. Actually, it's a great time to be a Pennsylvania sportsman because there are a lot of opportunities right now and even more coming this weekend, so uh, this is the time to be thinking about it, so this is why we chose this as the time to do this. So we're going to talk about the impact of CWD on Pennsylvania's deer and hunters. First, I want to give you a little bit of information about the National Deer Association and who we are. You may have you may recognize the name Quality Deer Management Association. That's who we were before this. Uh, we were the Quality Deer Management Association and the National Deer Alliance. Those two organizations merged about this time last year, creating the National Deer Association. Uh, but this is this comes right from our website. You can check us out at deerassociation.com. Uh, just the pertinent points I'll read to you. The National Deer Association is the leading conservation organization dedicated to conserving North America's favorite game animal. Hard to argue that uh, deer is North America's favorite game animal. And our mission statement is to ensure the future of wild deer, wildlife habitat, and hunting. Uh, again, check us out at deerassociation.com. You can find a lot more detail there. And in a little bit, I'm going to talk about all the things we've been doing for chronic wasting disease, not just in Pennsylvania, but across the country. Uh, our organization, incidentally, has been around for actually going on almost 40 years now, and we are proud to have a lot of members here in the Keystone State. So uh, that's who we are, 
And we have, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of communications work on CWD with the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the University of Pennsylvania through the Pennsylvania Wildlife Futures Program. Some of the things that you may have seen out on social media or even on the Game Commission's website were things that we produced in conjunction with those groups. So we're very deeply involved in this and we're proud to be. Uh, for the nation's leading deer organization, we have to be involved in chronic wasting disease. And we're even doing things as uh, very soon legislation is going to be introduced to help give our states more money and resources to deal with this disease. And we actually helped write some of that legislation. I have personally testified in front of Congress on two occasions on this issue, and uh, we're very deeply involved. And I'll have more on that in just a bit. So I don't think you can do this without going through what CWD is, and I will apologize right out of the gate if you're looking at this ridiculous slide and you're saying, that's it, I'm bailing out on this thing. I don't blame you. I hate slides like this, but chronic wasting disease is, uh, it's not simple. And so I put this up here uh, because I want to go through these point by point so that the, the group here has a good understanding of what CWD actually is. Uh, it's a brain disease. It impacts deer, elk, and moose. Uh, the prions or prions, uh, prions is the proper way to say it. Some people call them uh, prions, but prions are shed in bodily fluids, as you can see there, saliva, feces, urine, et cetera. Uh, the bottom line is this is highly contagious. So we're all still living, unfortunately, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is very similarly how, to how CWD spreads in deer. So we all have, unfortunately, uh, experience on this, on this issue. Um, it is uh, indistinguishable, indistinguishable among infected deer, and we'll talk about that in a second. That's one of the things that makes this challenging, is you might be looking at a deer that looks totally healthy when, in fact, it has the disease. Again, we'll get into that. Once it does show symptoms, it has a very brief clinical phase, and so once it's showing symptoms, it's not going to be alive much longer. Uh, prions exist in the environment for years, so it's not something... Um, I'm not going to get into a, a big, long dissertation on prions, but uh, if you can wrap your head around this, they don't, they're not even actually living bodies, uh, but this is, what it, this is what causes the infection. So the uh, most reliable test, unfortunately, is done after the animal is dead, so that creates some challenges. There's no vaccination or treatment, and it is 100% fatal. A deer that has CWD, it is a death sentence. Uh, some people get EHD and CWD confused. EHD, a deer can survive EHD. Now, a lot of them don't, but they can, but they cannot survive CWD, uh, period, 100% fatal. And so it's a challenge, and we have a significant role to play as hunters. So that's the end of the long bullet list of items here, uh, but I wanted to make sure we went through that very carefully to give you an understanding of what this disease actually is. So this next series of slides I'm going to work through should be uh, very concerning, if not borderline terrifying to you. Uh, this is what the USGS map of chronic wasting disease looked like in the country prior to 2001 when they started mapping these things. And as you can see in the, in the lower right there, you see the gray areas or CWD that is in free ranging populations. And the yellow dots are CWD that, is, that was found in captive facilities. So I'm gonna scroll through these and watch, just watch how this grows. This is before 2001. This is 2004, five, and just so on. I'm gonna scroll all the way up to 2021. Shows up first in Pennsylvania, 2012, in a captive facility. And then it starts to show up in the wild herd. Another captive facility. You see it spreading across the country till now. Very sobering, very concerning. Uh, it's, it's not quite everywhere, but it's in 26 states. Uh, that's a lot. More than half of our states have it. And so uh, obviously this is reason to be concerned, uh, but this, this map is very compelling. And you know, it's not getting better this is not a disease that's gonna just retreat, okay? So it's gonna to continue to spread across the country. As I said, uh, there is now five different disease management areas in Pennsylvania. And uh, there have been people say all the time, well, what does it really do to the population? I still see a lot of deer. There is definitely science and research out there that show population decline can happen because of CWD. 
and the financial impacts of this disease. That 80%, that pie chart there represents the number of people who uh, go hunting that hunt deer. So 80% of all people who buy a hunting license are deer hunters. And so when you think about how all of wildlife conservation is funded, a lot of that is on the backs of deer hunters and deer. And the next closest species is nowhere, nowhere near deer, what deer is. So deer are critically important, not just if you're a deer hunter, but let's say you're a person that enjoys watching songbirds. Well, there is money that's generated by deer hunting and license sales that goes to manage things like that. So uh, deer are critically important and they can't be understated. So CWD, you saw the maps, I talk about wild herds and captive herds, and this has drawn some concern and confusion. So I wanna address it here a little bit, Kip will address it further. Uh, and the, the bottom line is, there are a lot of things we don't know about chronic wasting disease as we continue to catch up with the science. But one of the things we do know is that moving deer is bad. Uh, moving them, and if you see the, the picture on the left there in the back of a UTV or a pickup from a deer harvested by a hunter, can be bad if that deer is in, infected and also deer moving in the back of trailers, live deer being transferred between deer farms, also not good because again, we're moving animals. And that's the fastest way for sure to spread this disease by moving animals around the landscape. Now, uh, the reason I have these split off here, a lot of people are confused about this. A lot of people think that the, that the Pennsylvania Game Commission has authority on uh, deer farming. And that's not true. It is actually the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And so uh, the, it's the Pennsylvania Game Commission. They regulate the deer that we're hunting, the wild deer. Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture uh, oversees the, the uh, deer farming industry. And so I bring this up to say uh, hunters have a lot of questions. And I can tell you that I was just in Warren County at a public meeting there where, where DMA-5 was just established. And eight out of every 10 questions that I received had to do with deer farming. And I had to explain to them uh, that my organization is primarily focused on wild deer. The Game Commission can't answer these questions for you. You have to go to the Department of Agriculture for that. So um, this picture I just want to point out is not from Warren. Uh, we had a lot of people, but we, we practice social distancing as well. But I've always just loved this picture because it just shows when there's a, a sportsman issue, uh, people show up. People care about their deer, they care about their hunting and their heritage. And that was a very good meeting in Warren. There were a lot of concerned sportsmen there. And I'm sure other areas, other people that live in disease management areas. And even if you don't live in a disease management area, I'm sure you're concerned if, as you look at that map and see uh, what's happening across not just Pennsylvania, but the country. So I mentioned CWD in deer is, uh, it's, one of the biggest challenges we have is that it's not something that you can readily see. Now, this is a deer that I photographed last summer, and I couldn't tell you if this deer had CWD or if it didn't. And that's one of the big challenges because for a lot of people, and I get this, seeing is believing. You can have a deer that's positive with CWD, but it doesn't show clinical symptoms for two years. So this deer could, in fact, this adult doe could be carrying chronic wasting disease. The only way we would know that is if she was harvested and we tested her. And so this makes it very challenging for people who say things like, well, I've never seen a sick or dead deer. The reality is most people will never see a sick or dead deer because it's just, it's hard to see that, again, that very brief window where an animal has clinical symptoms. So that's a challenge. And so I like sharing this slide. Now this originally, I saw this for the first time from our friend, Dr. Kristen Schuler, who's at Cornell University, also a native Pennsylvanian. And she always talks in her presentations about the precautionary principle. And this is one of the challenges we face with uh, people want to want to be proven that CWD is really out there. So it's like, let's wait and see if it's really bad. But then by the time you wait and see if it's really bad, you find out you're one of these frogs and you're already, you're already boiled. And so uh, we rely, our organization, the National Deer Association is 100% science-based. And any position we put out on CWD or any information we put out on CWD is 100% based on peer reviewed science, period. We don't put out conjecture, we don't put out fluff. Uh, what we put out is based on science. And so uh, there is plenty of proof that CWD is bad, despite the fact though, again, that people that seeing is, if they don't see it, they don't believe it. And I certainly understand that. And that's one of the challenging things about this disease. The other challenge is uh, we're biased. 
I mean, I'm certainly biased as a hunter and I, I, we're all biased in many ways. And we will, we want to interpret things in ways that are consistent with what we want. So if somebody says, uh, well, CWD is really not that, not that bad. And then someone else says, no, it's really bad. I'm probably going to be like, well, is it really that bad? Because I don't want it to be bad. And I don't want to have these challenges that we face to deal with CWD. And I get that as well, uh, whether it be politics or sports teams or whatever, uh, we're biased. And that's just the reality. None of us escape that. Uh, the other thing is we research shows that we are not willing typically to sacrifice something today for the better of tomorrow, which might sound really sad because you're thinking, well, I want my children and grandchildren to have X, Y, or Z, things that I had when I was growing up. But the research shows that we, we say that, but we may not really mean it. And so when people say things like, well, I need to kill my buck right now, and they don't care about other practices that they may do to help slow uh, the spread of CWD, that's reality for a lot of people. And so uh, are we willing to make some sacrifices now for the long-term betterment of deer and hunting? And that's the part that comes back on hunters and the things that we can do uh, to slow the disease, slow the spread of the disease. So very challenging, totally get it. Uh, is it the end of the world everywhere? No, there are examples of positive outcomes in New York is one case where they had a positive case and were able to, uh, they've been able to, after going in there and removing deer from that area, they, they now can say that they don't get positive tests from that area. So there's one example, Norway has had positive response, Illinois as well. Uh, and then frankly, the states that have been able to keep CWD out, or at least think they don't have it in their state. Uh, those are some positive outcomes, and we need to uh, continue to contribute to those. So there is a path forward. Uh, this isn't the end of deer hunting uh, today, okay? There are things that we can do together to try to slow the spread. And I get it. As I mentioned, hunters, we want to hunt. We want to do things like be with our buddies in the blind and take selfies and have a great time out there. I mean, I, I do it myself. I'm a very avid deer hunter and have been a long time. Uh, hunters want to hunt. And they don't want to be burdened with this stuff. And I want to share also that we all have a role to play here. And so what I didn't mention to you at the outset, I'll go ahead and mention now. Uh, I own property in, in disease management area number two. And so this deer that I just harvested uh, less than a week ago was shot in that area. And because I shot the deer in that area, I have some unique responsibilities for what I can and can't do with this deer. And so what I can't do is I can't just load this deer up in my pickup truck and drive it back to where I live because I don't live in the disease management area, but my property's there. I can't bring that whole deer home. What I can do is I can take certain parts of the deer home, basically leaving the, the backbone and the head behind. I can take the meat uh, and I can leave the, the remaining more infectious parts there. I can find, if, if I'm lucky enough that there's a participating processor within the disease management area, I could also take that deer there. And then another final thing I'm going to do is I'll, I will submit that head for testing. And luckily within the disease management area, and frankly, within just a few miles of my property, there is a bin that the game commission has put out where I can drop that head and have the deer tested. And so, because I personally live in a disease management area and hunt in a disease management area, I'm living this with you. And so again, uh, this is, this is something that we all have to do our part and be part of this, uh, this, part of the solution to this issue. So really my final message to you, at least from my perspective, before you hear from the others is we need to be aware. We need to know what we can and can't do within disease management areas. We need to know that we can't, if we're hunting out of state, most states that we're hunting in, we can't just load up a deer and bring it back to Pennsylvania. Uh, so that's something that you need to know. And the game commission has put out plenty of information on their website uh, for you to look at that provides this information. And you can see one of the bins up in the upper left picture there. And then this is one of the pages from a flyer on CWD that the Game Commission has put out. Uh, finally, as far as the National Deer Association is concerned, we have on our website, and this is the most comprehensive clearinghouse of information on CWD that you can find. Uh, you can also go to the CWD Alliance website as well, which is uh, uh, another, another good source of information, but for our purposes, deerassociation.com slash CWD. We have dozens of articles. We have dozens of videos, all kinds of information on chronic wasting disease that you should know. And we try to do them in a way that you might actually want to watch them. 
uh, as well. So they're, they're done a little bit of a different way. And again, as I've said, we've done a lot of work also with the Game Commission, University of Pennsylvania, and frankly, several other states across the country. Uh, we're very involved in this issue. So if you haven't checked this out yet, please do. It's our CWD Resource Center. So with that, again, I'll remind you, if you have questions, put those in the Q&A. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker, Mr. Kip Adams, who's our Chief Conservation Officer at National Deer Association. Kip, it's all yours, buddy. All right, thank you, Nick. Great job and uh, certainly set the stage very well and explained uh, it, implications of CWD, exactly what it is and uh, what people need to be aware of. So uh, welcome everybody here tonight. Thank you for, for taking uh, this evening to be with us. My part of this now is I'm going to take the science that Nick just shared and talk about it more on a hunter level. I've been a wildlife biologist for more than 20 years now. I am very proud of what I get to do, but I am first and foremost a deer hunter. And, uh, and I am extremely proud of that. I'm a Pennsylvania native. I was born and raised in Tioga County. I still live in Tioga County now. Um, you know, and I love the fact that, uh, that I raised my kids here. And that's actually why I live here. I spent a decade in New Hampshire and Florida working for both of those state wildlife agencies. I wanted to come back. I wanted to raise my kids in, in PA and specifically in North Central PA. So uh, I choose to live here with my job now. I could live anywhere I wanted in the country. I love Pennsylvania. I love our hunting culture. I love the traditions that we have here. And, uh, and that's why I choose to be here. And that's why I fight so hard to keep those for us. So my part of this tonight then is let's talk about what this really is to hunters. We can understand, yes, this is fatal to deer and it, and it may negatively impact populations and this and that. But uh, from a hunting standpoint, what exactly does this mean to me or you? And, uh, and to really be able to do that, let's start with just understanding the importance of deer. Um, we know that about 79% of American hunters pursue deer. That's a lot. That is far more than any other species. Nick alluded to this, and I'm going to share the exact numbers with you. In the United States, there are somewhere around 11 million deer hunters. Now, the second most hunted species are turkeys. I grew up in northern Pennsylvania, so I grew up with a turkey call in my mouth. I love turkey hunting. But to show you that turkey hunters are the second most popular species, but for every turkey hunter, there's nearly four deer hunters. So nationwide, we have about 3 million turkey hunters. For everybody on here tonight that hunts turkeys, at times, it feels like they are all in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have about one and a half million duck hunters across the United States, less than a million elk hunters. I love to hunt elk. I love to hunt ducks and other waterfowl. I love to hunt turkeys but I love hunting deer more than anything else. And, and I'm proud to work with deer and to help ensure that we have deer to hunt in the future. We know from an industry and the deer drive the hunting industry. They are by far the most sought after game species and deer hunters contribute about 60% of the entire money that's generated from the hunting industry. And, and we're not talking within millions here. This is the B word, $37 billion. That's what the hunting industry is. That is huge. And deer hunters contribute well over half of that. In Pennsylvania alone, hunters contribute about 1.6 billion to our annual economy. So hunting is big business. It is a big deal. And that's why we need to do everything possible to ensure that we have this well into the future and that this terrible disease doesn't degrade this to the point that it negatively impacts this. So from a CWD end, there are numerous species that are susceptible and hunters are always involved here because as you look, these are all things that we like to chase around. Now. Unfortunately, we can't chase all of these in Pennsylvania. We certainly get to chase whitetails and elk, but across North America and actually across parts of the world, these are the species that are negatively impacted by CWD. CWD can kill every one of these. And are there others? There may be others. There might be other ones that we just haven't identified yet, but we know for sure that it does uh, impact mule deer and elk and black-tailed deer, which are a subspecies of mule deer, white tails, of course, moose, reindeer, and, and possibly others. So from a hunting end, CWD, does it impact just hunters? Not by any means. It impacts anybody who likes deer, elk, moose, et cetera, photographers, wildlife watchers. However, hunters are the original conservationists and hunters are relative to Hunters are the One slide in about 10 seconds. 
And this is what we need to know from a hunting end. From a CWD standpoint, there is no vaccine, there is no cure, and it's 100% fatal to all whitetails. That's a big deal. We also know that specifically in whitetails, the probability of infection increases with age in both bucks and does. So as they get older, they are more likely to have the disease. And in adult bucks are more than likely to be infected than adult does. They're about twice as likely. And this plays into some of the regulation changes that we see or, or things that, are, that our agency wants us to do. And if you are from another state that are attending here tonight, or uh, you hunt in other states, or you have friends in other states, each state battles this a little bit differently, but there is almost always differences in how they attack this from the buck side and the doe side, and this is why. Because adult bucks are about twice as likely to, to have the disease. However, that doesn't mean that bucks are the only thing we need to worry about. Because in almost every population, even though bucks are more likely to have it, there's almost always at least twice as many adult does out there as adult bucks, like you see in this photo. So we really need to battle it from both sides. Well, this picture, this is, is one of the first three cases of CWD found in the wild east of the Mississippi River. This was out in Colorado and Wyoming and some Western states for, for decades before we heard about it here in the east. It existed out there in very low density deer herds where it wasn't shared through a lot of deer just simply because deer don't exist at anywhere near the same rates as they do here in the east. And there's very few deer and there's very few deer hunters out there. So it existed there, spread very, very slowly. The turning point was when it hit Wisconsin. First time it was east of the Mississippi River. First time it's in a very high density whitetail herd in a state that has a lot of deer hunters. Now I show you this one specifically because Nick did a good job showing you that picture of the deer saying, does this adult doe have CWD or not? Well, you can't tell by looking at it. The reason is those deer or any deer can have it for an average of 18 to 24 months before it shows any symptoms. Once it starts showing symptoms, it goes downhill very rapidly, but it has it for a, quite a period of time. Well, some hunters are going to say, well, what's the big deal then? You know, if it looks normal, why should I care? The reason you should care is the entire time it has that disease it is shedding those infectious materials that it then can infect other deer that come in contact with it. So in its urine, its feces, its saliva, etc., it can infect other deer, even though it appears completely fine. Obviously, it's not, and it's making this disease worse in those deer herds. So that's why we need to worry. Now, this deer here, I show you this specifically because it's one of the first that we knew that had it. But take a look at these antlers. This deer was killed in firearm season. Big set of antlers, isn't it? This is a very healthy looking deer. Look at the body of the deer, though. This deer has literally wasted away, hence the name. These deer will have the disease for 18 to 24 months, start showing symptoms, and then they waste away very, very quickly. However, the fact that this has big antlers lets us know that this whole summer that this deer was growing these antlers, it must have appeared fine. Because if the, if the deer is not fine, it certainly could not have put all of that energy into antler growth. So what this means is if this hunter would have shot this deer in archery season, it's highly likely that it would have appeared completely normal and not had any of these waste and away signs. It's only now that, yes, it did start showing symptoms. It's later in the year into the firearm season that it starts wasting away. Because clearly from April through September, this deer was, was healthy enough to grow a, a set of big antlers. So this is important for hunters to know that we likely will never witness a deer that is wasted away. However, everybody in Pennsylvania likely in our lifetime will see not only one, but, but many cases, numerous deer that actually do have this disease. And that is what we are trying so hard to minimize and stop the spread of this so that that actually does not happen. Well, from a, a CWD perspective, how does it actually get introduced in a new area? There's folks on here from Warren County tonight, you know, six months ago at this time, you didn't have it in your area, or at least you didn't know that it was there, but now it is. This is being spread all over the place, and there's a few different ways. So I think it's important that hunters realize how it comes in. The best way that this is being moved is by movement of an infected captive deer. And the reason for this is because there is not a reliable and a practical live animal test. The only way that we can test for sure if a deer has it is a test after the deer has died. Now, there's a lot of research going into trying to develop a better live animal test. And I am the first one that, that hopes that that comes about very soon. Actually, the live animal tests we have right now are much better in deer than they are in elk. They, they don't work in elk very much at all. 
but they're only good at being accurate once a deer is in the later stages of having the disease. Any of the early stages, while it still can infect other deer, the live animal tests just simply aren't that good right now. And to say, well, are there actually that many deer being moved around? It is crazy how many deer are being moved. This is from a master's thesis. This is in Pennsylvania over a 10 year period. These are all legal recorded movements of captive deer among facilities. So everything you see here are captive deer facilities in Pennsylvania where deer were, were moved legally and then recorded. Were there others? There, there probably were others because some of these may not have uh, followed all the rules and they may not have been able to, to actually move them. But these are ones that we know occurred from a legal standpoint. And it's crazy to see how many of these animals are being moved. Now, this is not bashing the deer farmers by any means. They don't want to move deer that have the disease either because that is not good for them. The problem comes in because we don't have a good live animal test that these animals then get moved all over unwillingly and certainly not intentionally moving the disease. But the reality of it is it happens and we are infecting new deer herds, both in captivity and in All right, we somehow lost Kip there. Um, well, let's do this while Kip is, I did mention that he is in North Central Pennsylvania and internet service, let me turn my video on here. Internet service is not the greatest. So we'll see if he can uh, get back in here. And in the meantime, I might be able to save a little bit of time here uh, later. I have a few of the questions that are in the Q&A that we can uh, that we can answer, at least get started with those. Uh, and so uh, the first one is, what is, uh, what is NDA's position on the CWD bill, which was introduced to Congress yesterday? And thank you for that question. And our position is uh, positive on that because we helped write it, uh, along with several other conservation groups that were part of it. So we support it. We want to see money go to our states. Uh, to help manage this disease. And uh, so that at least uh, answers that first question. Kip, what we did since you got cut off is we went ahead and answered the first question in the Q&A. And when you're ready to reset, I'll get out of the way and let you do that. All right, sorry about that. Um, I didn't realize that I lost service, Nick, but yes, if you can see me, uh, I can uh, can start here again. So my apologies to, uh, to the audience. Can you see me okay? Yep, no problem. Go ahead and take it away. All right, let's do this then. You were on the slide uh, showing the map. I guess it not only uh, with the movements. You were on the slide with the map showing the movements. The one in Pennsylvania or the one in Texas, Nick? You were you were just wrapping that one up, and I think you were about to move to Texas. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Just the joys of our one of the, the joys of living in a very rural situation. A great place to raise kids, great place to hunt, but not always the best internet service. So, uh, all Well, as Kip said, not always the best internet service. So let's go ahead and keep answering questions until he gets back with us. Uh, next question. Uh, any thoughts on reports of COVID infected deer? The topic came up in New York State, but dropped out. Was it substantiated? So yeah, they're uh, not just deer. Other, a lot of other mammals can, can, uh, can get COVID. And so there was a study that was put out, I think, and, and Andrea can help me here if I messed this up, but I'm pretty sure it came from uh, Fish and Wildlife Service or another federal agency where they did test some deer and found that they had COVID. And so that caused a lot of uproar and got people all excited and worried. Uh, but uh, they did not, deer did not show clinical symptoms of COVID like human beings. And so the debate then went on to does it impact people? And uh, if, if someone shoots a deer with COVID and they're field dressing it, and what we, we give the same advice we give anyway, regardless of the disease or not, is that take precautions when you're field dressing deer, although there had, no, there had not been any, uh, any official. 
um, occurrences of deer impacting people with COVID because deer may have had COVID. So that answers that question. We'll get that one out of the way. Uh, and Kip, you ready to go back on? I, uh, yes, I will run this off the hotspot on my phone, Nick, and just forget my uh, internet service then. So uh, this should, we should be good for the rest of the time then. Okay. All right, folks, third time's a charm. So uh, let's go with this. All right, so I talked about the movements in Pennsylvania that I, the map I showed being all movements. These are movements that were from CWD positive facilities. They weren't known to be positive at the time, but over 1,150 deer in the last three years have been moved from CWD positive facilities to other facilities in the state of Texas to be moving around in spreading this disease. Well, that's not the only way, though. We also know that we can disease by immigration of infected wild deer. About half to three quarters of all the yearling bucks in, in Pennsylvania or any other state will disperse one to five miles from their home range when they're 12 to 18 months old. They can take the disease with them. A much smaller number of yearling does will disperse and move this disease. So there's certainly a natural movement ability as well. Um, but there's also, and this is likely the second biggest way that we're moving the disease, is by contact with the remains of an infected deer. So this is where as hunters, we can really help ourselves to limit the spread. Deer that have this disease, the high risk parts of deer, eyes, brain, spleen, backbone, that's where the infectious materials congregate. If we harvest a deer and we move those high risk parts somewhere else, we can then move that disease into a new area. So that is why the Game Commission has regulations to restrict this. If you're in a disease zone, you cannot remove those parts and move them elsewhere. And this is in an attempt to minimize the spread of the disease. This is a map of the United States. Uh, you can see in Wisconsin, this is uh, four of the counties that have a core area of CWD. This is during two hunting seasons, 2016 and 2017, hunters from all over the United States that traveled to Wisconsin to hunt took deer, or I said this, harvested deer, and in many cases moved them out of that disease zone. So what it was, there were hunters from 49 of the 50 states uh, went to that core area and harvested deer. Now, did they take all these deer out of there? We, we don't know that, but we do know they harvested deer. Even Alaska and Hawaii re residents went there and killed deer. Delaware is the only state that was not on this list where somebody shot a deer in the core area of Wisconsin. So if hunters did leave that core area with those high-risk parts, they could have unknowingly been moving the disease back when they went back home or, or wherever they were from. So this is why we don't want to be moving these parts. So next step then is, okay, I kind of understand how we can move this around, but what are the actual impacts to us as hunters and to society? Well, lots of things change in an area once CWD is confirmed. And the first is often deer population reduction. And this is the first place that hunters then often get, all get their hackles up. We see this, we have the disease now, ideally we should go to this. And deer herds are often reduced in many cases, or at least they're tried to be reduced to below what the habitats can support. You know, hunters, do we like this? No, we don't like this at all. You've never heard a hunter say, man, when I go hunting tomorrow, I hope I see fewer deer than I did yesterday. You know, as hunters, we always want to see deer or we want to see more deer. The reality of it is though, deer can share this disease with each other. So the best thing that we can do to ensure that we're gonna have healthy deer herds in the future is if we're in a disease zone, we should reduce these deer herds, take an extra dose this year to make sure that we can limit the amount of spread of this disease so that down the road, we can make sure we do have healthy deer and not continue to increase in this prevalence rate. We also know that once you get it, it's the end of deer season as we know it. Hey, I grew up in a Northern Pennsylvania hunting camp, a very traditional camp. Everybody liked to wear the same coat they did the year before, have the same guys at camp, go to the same tree to hunt. I get it. But the reality is once the disease shows up, it all goes out the window. You know, now we have check stations. We have CWD samples that are necessary. In many cases, now you're going home with a headless deer. And this is all different. I totally get it. Is it an inconvenience to do these? Sure. But you know what, if you care about deer and you care about hunting, then 
it's an inconvenience absolutely worth going through to make sure that we do get to hunt in the future and that our kids and grandkids can as well. Other things that we see changed are you get movement regulations, uh, we get longer hunting seasons, we get additional seasons, we get sharp shooting. These are all in efforts to limit the, the number of deer that have this disease, keep it from spreading to protect us as hunters well into the future. We also have a loss of privileges. These are, I'm just showing you things that we know we have to expect. If you're in a disease zone, immediately there's no more feeding deer, there's no more baiting. In most places in Pennsylvania, we can't do this anyway, but many other states can. No using minerals, no urine attractants. Um, I do summer camera surveys and have for nearly the last two decades on our farm every year, well in advance of our hunting season. Uh, this is the way that I determine how many antler this year we're gonna shoot each year. All of this goes out the window as soon as this disease is in your area. I know a lot of people that use salt or, uh, or trace minerals to photograph deer, to watch deer. Some of these people hunt, not all of them. There's a lot of people that don't hunt. They do this simply to photograph deer or because they're wildlife watchers. So this certainly impacts us as hunters more than anybody else. But there's a lot larger segment of society that is negatively impacted once this disease shows up. From a hunting end, mature bucks no longer are encouraged. And you're saying, why? You know, Pennsylvania, the last two decades, we have been building an age structure of deer and changing that old, you know, all nothing but yearling bucks. But once you have the disease, mature bucks aren't encouraged anymore because remember, I said earlier, mature bucks are about twice as likely to have the disease as adult does and, and certainly more than twice as likely as young bucks. So we want to start driving this age structure a little bit younger, which there's a lot of hunters out there that say, man, I have been managing deer herds. I've been passing younger bucks. I have loved the opportunity to hunt older bucks. And suddenly that's not the wisest thing anymore if you're in a disease zone. We also know then that we have a lot of license money that is diverted. And it's diverted from herd management and habitat management, things like CWD sampling, monitoring, surveillance. And these are all very important. These are very necessary things. Um, Wisconsin, who I said earlier, was the first state east of the Mississippi River to have this. Since 01, when they found it, they have spent over $50 million on these things. Just think about this for a minute. If rather than spending it on those, if they could have spent it on hunter access, land purchases, habitat management, et cetera. Um, how much farther ahead we could be. Now, I'm not talking bad about the Wisconsin DNR by any means. They need to spend this on those other things. And I'm glad they're spending it on those other things. But man, if we have so many other good things we could spend it on, if the disease was not there. So this is a reality. Once it does show up, a bunch of this money gets diverted. We also know the hunting participation can decline. I'm gonna show you some more data from Wisconsin. This is the last year that they sold hunting licenses before they identified the disease. The next year, hunting license sales dropped a bunch. The next year, they recovered a little bit, but over the next decade, they never did recover to what they were pre-CWD. And well, some people say, well, you know what, if there's fewer hunters, that's good because I don't want to be crowded anyway. Well, that's a pretty short study way to look at this because fewer hunters leads to less money for wildlife management. If fewer hunters leads to less advocates for hunting. Neither one of those are good for hunters. We talked earlier, deer hunters pay the lion's share of all of our wildlife management programs. They pay for deer management, other game management, songbird management, non-game management, et cetera. So if we have fewer hunters and particularly fewer deer hunters, all of our wildlife species are negatively impacted. And fewer hunters from an advocate standpoint, there's only 4% of the US population that buys a hunting license. And we don't get to do anything in this country because 4% of us want to do it. Fortunately, we get to hunt because about 80% of American adults support hunting, support legal, ethical, regulated hunting. That's why we get to, to hunt. So we need every advocate we possibly can for hunting. So fewer hunters does not bode well for us at all. Well, if you want to look at this from an economic standpoint, there's tremendous economic repercussions in a region. And this is because there's no way to decontaminate a CWD positive site. The infectious materials remain in that soil for years and years and years. Uh, and land values decline. In Missouri, a CWD positive state, when the disease first hit there, they had a two to $400 per acre loss in land values in those areas. That's, whether you're a hunter or not, if you're not a hunter and you want to sell land and suddenly it's not worth nearly as much simply because of this, well, obviously this negatively impacts hunters but it impacts a much broader uh, segment 
of society as well. Uh, we also know that no state has won the CWD battle. New York is certainly the closest to this, and uh, they haven't found any other positive deer around that site, so kudos to them. But we know that the prions remain in the soil for years. The disease continues to spread through those deer herds for years. If you, if you have infectious materials in a spot now, a deer literally one, two, or more years later can come in contact with that soil and still contract the disease. That's how dangerous this thing is. Well, I'm going to show you three slides here, three graphs from Wisconsin. This is in South Central Iowa County. This is from the years 2002, right after they found the disease, up through uh, 2014. And they have, these are the CWD prevalence rates for adult bucks, adult does, yearling bucks, and yearling does. We're just going to pay attention to the adult bucks, though. These are the solid blue line. And you can see back in 2002, what this showed is only about 1% or 2% of those adult bucks in this county had the disease. But fast forward to 2014, and look what happened over 30% of those bucks did. Look at the growth rates. These are how fast CWD spreads through these deer herds. I'm gonna show you the same thing for Southeastern Richland County. Here, 35% of the adult bucks did. North Central Iowa County, over 45% of those bucks did. Does it look like these growth rates are slowing down? Not at all. And what happens is we know from population modeling that once the prevalence rate or the mortality rate in does um, hits 20 to 30 percent, those populations are declining. That means there's not as many deer each year for you or me to hunt, which means then permit sales or any of those targets drop, fewer tags, which means there's fewer bucks out there. So all of this starts to fall apart. And I'm sharing this with you to say, you know, like we are quickly reaching these same type of growth curves here in Pennsylvania. Andrea has some great data that she's going to share next, but uh, we are doing everything possible and providing all of the support that we can to the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and they are doing everything they can to stop this before it ever gets to these high rates. This is what's coming. We know this very clearly. This is what's happened in every other state that has it. So uh, Pennsylvania will be no different. So we need to stop it back while we're only at, you know, one or two or 3% prevalence rates so we don't get to these levels. So once we do this, what does it mean? Fewer mature bucks? Absolutely. Lower deer densities? Absolutely, we're going to have fewer deer, fewer disease-free deer. This is a big standpoint from a, you know, from a uh, consumption end. I love to eat deer. I'm guessing most of you here tonight do. It just means that we can't eat as many. So these are, these are serious concerns. Well, speaking of eating deer then, is CWD positive venison safe to eat? Well, according to both the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control, there's no evidence that we can contract the, the human version of this prion disease, which is called the kirchfeld jakob disease, from eating CWD-infected deer. However, they both strongly encourage people, do not eat venison if you're in a disease area until you receive a satisfactory test. Our organization, the National Deer Association, absolutely supports this. We tell people, if you're in a disease zone, have that deer tested. The Game Commission needs that data so they can monitor prevalence rate, so they can monitor spread of the disease, and then you know whether that deer is not is safe to eat. You know, and there's going to be some people say, I'm going to eat it anyway. Well, that's certainly your right, but we certainly hope that you share that venison with others as well. And are you going to share it with you know, your little boy or your little girl or your niece or nephew or that little boy or little girl down the street? Um, I hope not. You know, I hope that you have that deer tested. And once you do receive a satisfactory test, then absolutely share. Hunters are some of the, the, the most unselfish people in the world with regard to sharing venison meals and sharing uh, unprepared venison for others to be able to eat. So, and we're in a great spot to be able to do that. But if you're in a disease zone, I strongly encourage you to get that tested first before you share it. All right, well, let's end then with just some information about Pennsylvania. We've heard a lot about CWD. We hear what this means once we have it. But let's look at it, what exactly it is that we're trying to save from it. You know, from a hunting end, there's a lot of really, really good things going on in Pennsylvania. At the National Deer Association, we compile an annual deer report every year. We collect data from every single state wildlife agency on harvest numbers, on age structures of harvest. and put this all together in an annual deer report. These are all available for free downloads at our, at our website, at deerassociation.com. You can see the deer reports. But take a look at this. This is the antler buck harvest across the United States. We publish these reports every January. So the, the 2021 deer report 
came out in January of this year. So it included harvest data from the most recent season that was done, which was the 2019 into 20 deer season. And at that time, what it showed was the top five states that shot more antler deer than anybody else in the country. Texas is almost always number one because they're huge, right? Big state, a lot of hunters, a lot of deer. But look at this, we were third on the list for total numbers of deer. Well, this doesn't really paint a fair picture though, right? Because Texas is a lot bigger than Michigan, Pennsylvania, or all the other states with the exception of Alaska. So we also look at this, hey, how does that antler buck harvest per square mile rate? So this is a little more apples to apples comparison. And what we see is we are right at the top of this. Michigan is the only state that shoots more bucks on a per square mile basis than us, and they just barely edge us out. So Pennsylvania hunters are really, really good at shooting bucks. Well, let's look at the animal side too, because this is really where the rubber meets the road on how good we do uh, managing deer herds. What we see is we're actually number two on this list. Texas is the only state that shoots more animal this deer than us, but we can look at this one on a per square mile basis too. And you know what? We are still number two. Delaware is the only state that shoots more than us. And if you take a look at this, this is an incredible harvest rate. To harvest over five antlerless deer per square mile is just astounding. I've been with QDMA now NDA for almost 20 years. Prior to that, I was New Hampshire fishing games, deer and bear biologist. New Hampshire's at the northern limit of whitetail range. But what's amazing was there were many places in New Hampshire that didn't have five deer per square mile of a standing crop. You know, we harvested way less than one deer per square mile during the season. And here in Pennsylvania, we're harvesting more than five antlerless deer. And if you take a look at this slide, look at this from a geography standpoint. Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey. The top four states, where are we? We're in the mid-Atlantic region. We are in an absolute sweet spot in the United States from a deer productivity standpoint. We have lots of deer. We have high reproductive rates, which provides tremendous opportunity for us as hunters to see deer and harvest deer. That is great. But you know what, from the responsibility end, we also need to make sure we are harvesting enough deer to keep deer herds healthy. And this is especially true if you're in a disease zone. So many Pennsylvania hunters can, can take an additional antlerless deer this year and the deer herd will be healthier for it. If you're in a disease zone, I absolutely encourage you to go ahead and take another one. That will safeguard that deer herd. Um, it will allow it to be healthier in the future minimize the spread of this disease, and you can be doing your part as being a great steward of, of our precious wildlife resources. Well, if we put this all together for Pennsylvania, and I'm listening, you know, Pennsylvania rocks. And this is not just because I'm a Pennsylvania native and I'm, you know, a big fan of the state. From a deer hunting end, we absolutely do. I have the privilege in working in 20 to 25 different states a year with deer hunters and, and their state wildlife agencies, and Pennsylvania is absolutely rocking. We are one of only three states that shoots over 300,000 deer annually. Pretty cool. In this last hunting season that we have all the data for, we harvested 3.6 antler bucks per square mile. As I said, Michigan is the only one that edged us out. For the 11th year in a row, over half of our buck harvest uh, was over or at least two and a half years old. So we have arguably the oldest age structure for bucks that we've ever had, or at least in the last 100 years. We harvested more than five antlers deer per square mile. And altogether, if you add our bucks and does together, we shot 8.7 deer per square mile. That was number one in the whole country. Not a single state shot more than we did. Pretty cool. So we have lots of deer. We have some really good deer hunters and we have lots of opportunity to continue to shoot even more deer this year. So current status to this end, man, there's a lot of concern about increased spread of this into new states new areas with states. We absolutely see this in Pennsylvania with, with the Warren County uh, incident there at that captive facility and a new disease management area around that now. So there's a lot of concern, not just about deer, but all future wildlife management, certainly for our deer herds. But as we said, deer hunters and those hunter dollars fund so much of our other programs that there's a lot of other species out there really paying attention to what's going on in the deer world and, uh, and looking at it you know, uh, with big eyes because if deer hunter numbers drop, and license sales drop, then uh, there's a lot of other wildlife that is negatively impacted as well. So is this the end of deer hunting? I'm an optimist. I'm going to say no. It's not going to be the end. We're going to solve this. But we absolutely have to be vigilant to minimize transmission in the existing areas, to prevent introduction of CWD into new areas, and we need to support research and our Game Commission's efforts with this disease. It's certainly different than in the past. 
absolutely can be argued that it's an inconvenience, some of what we have to do now. But I'm the first to say it's an inconvenience absolutely worth doing. I'm willing to debone that meat before I come out of a disease zone just for the right to continue to hunt there and to continue to have that opportunity. So I certainly will be doing my part and encouraging others to do their part. Let's, let's do all we can to stop moving live deer. Let's do all we can to stop moving the high risk parts of deer that we harvest. Tell our hunt buddies the same to not be moving those parts because those are things we can do every single day to help battle this disease. I'll end in by saying, uh, if you would like some more information, we have a, a document on our website. It's at deerassociation.com, free download. It's a recommended practices for deer hunters. This talks about what you can do from a habitat management standpoint, from a hunting management standpoint, from a hunter management standpoint, particularly if you are in a disease zone to do everything possible to battle this disease. And with that, um, we're going to do a QA and a once we get done here. Again, huge apologies on my part for the, the internet uh, outage. Uh, once we're done here, this is my uh, email address. At any point, please, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Um, I am glad to help. I talk to people across the country uh, every day, and I'm certainly always glad to talk to, uh, to some Pennsylvania folks. So with that, Nick, I will stop sharing and uh, turn this over and uh, let Andrea then share everything that the Game Commission is doing and fighting so hard to make sure that we safeguard this precious resource that we have. All right, Kip, thank you. And uh, yes, Andrea, you're up. Uh, remind people, please send your questions to the Q&A section of uh, the Zoom panel in front of you. Again, that's at the bottom of the screen. And we've got a number of questions there and really good questions that we're looking forward to answering. So with that, let me hand it over to Andrea Corman. She is the Pennsylvania Game Commission CWD biologist. Andrea, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, okay, sounds good. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. Um, to start us off, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of CWD in Pennsylvania. So CWD surveillance in Pennsylvania has been ongoing since 1998 beginning with testing clinical suspect animals. So those are the animals that are displaying the clinical signs of the disease, like the stumbling and excessive drooling. And so those are the animals that we were focusing on testing. Now, in response to the CWD discovery in Wisconsin in 2002, the Pennsylvania Interagency CWD Response Plan was developed by agencies, including the Game Commission, Pennsylvania Department of Ag, USDA, and many others in 2003. This also marked the beginning of our statewide sampling. Then in 2006, authority over the captive servant industry was transferred from the Game Commission to Pennsylvania Department of Ag. So in Pennsylvania, what this means is CWD is actually managed under two different agencies. Then in 2012, we had our first detections of CWD in Pennsylvania, and in July of last year, the Board of Commissioners approved the Game Commission's CWD response plan, and we began implementing it last fall. As of September of this year, the Game Commission has tested over 108,000 whitetails and more than 1,600 elk for CWD since 1998. The disease has been found in approximately 730 wild whitetails and so far no elk. Most of the animals tested include hunter harvested deer, uh, roadkill deer, and those clinical suspects with a few of them being collected from other means. Now going back to our first detection. In October of 2012, CWD was detected in a captive facility, which is represented on this map by a yellow star, in Adams County. And this resulted in the creation of Disease Management Area, or DMA-1, which is that green area surrounding the star. That facility was depopulated. Two months later, three hunter-harvested, free-ranging deer represented by the red dots tested positive in Blair and Bedford counties resulting in the establishment of DMA-2. Now, given the distance here, these events are not necessarily related. 
so it's hard to say exactly how CWD got into Pennsylvania. Then DMA-3 was created in 2014 after CWD was detected in two captive facilities in Jefferson County. Now in 2017, two things happened. If you notice, DMA-1 is gone. So that was dissolved in 2017 after it went five consecutive years without any additional CWD detection. And you'll see there's another yellow star in Lancaster County, which was another captive facility that tested positive and resulted in the creation of DMA-4 in 2018. Now this year, you'll see there was another captive facility, this time in Warren County, that tested positive for CWD and resulted in the creation of DMA-5. Now within DMAs, there is a ban on removing high-risk parts, feeding deer, and using urine-based attractants. Even with those restrictions in place and the increased surveillance, DMAs have continued to expand and more deer test positive each year. If the trajectory of the disease increases in Pennsylvania, like it has in other states, the infection rate in portions of Blair, Bedford, and Fulton counties will likely exceed 30% in the next one to two decades and will continue to spread throughout the state. So our revised and updated response plan establishes a framework for managing CWD in Pennsylvania. Currently, the best management strategy to control CWD is to reduce the deer abundance in infected areas to slow the rate of the disease transmission and also remove those in infected individuals from the landscape. Many of the strategies in the plan focus on ways to limit spread of the disease and prevent it from becoming established in new areas. So the response plan identifies four different types of management areas. So there's the disease management areas, which we already saw on the previous maps. There's the established area, enhanced surveillance units, and containment zone. Now, each of these is associated with different objectives and strategies. So one of the steps the Game Commission has taken is the establishment of the disease management areas, or DMAs. These are our current DMAs, and DMAs are geographic areas where CWD has been found, and where specific rules apply to help slow the human assisted spread of CWD, like those bans on feeding deer, using the urine based attractants, and moving the high risk parts. And I'll explain what I mean by high risk parts more later, but primarily that is referring to the brain and the spinal. Now, you may have noticed on the earlier maps that DMA2 expanded this year, so further into Center County and then also into portions of Northumberland and Dauphin counties. And that DMA-5 is also new this year. So we do test for CWD year round. So new detections can happen at any time and cause DMA boundaries to change. So be sure to always check the Game Commission website for the most up-to-date DMA boundaries to know for sure whether or not you're hunting in a DMA. Now, from those first three cases that were discovered in Blair and Bedford counties in 2012, CWD has firmly established itself on the landscape. More than 90% of all the CWD positive deer discovered in Pennsylvania since 2012 have come from that Fulton, Bedford, and Blair County area. So in order to do as much as possible, to prevent the neighboring areas from reaching this level of infection, the CWD established area was created, which is that light green on the map. Restricting the movement of high-risk parts from this area removes at least one avenue of spreading CWD, minimizing the odds of people transmitting the disease to other parts of DMA2, where CWD is still less common. The goal here is to limit 
CWD prevalence to no more than 5% of the adult deer in the established area. Now, the reason for this is because based on other states and models, once that 5% threshold is crossed, the disease prevalence begins to accelerate drastically. Now, based on unharvested adult deer, our sample prevalence in the established area has actually been above 5% since the 2018 season and is now actually close to 14%. To put that into perspective, that is approximately one in seven adult hunter harvested deer from the established area last season were positive for CWD. So it's clear that there is a significant problem within the established area. So we also have these enhanced surveillance units within DMAs, which are associated with a DMAP. So these areas are geographic regions around the location of a new CWD positive deer. And these are high priority animals in that they are on the leading edge of CWD expansion. So testing deer in these areas will help us understand if that CWD positive deer was an outlier or if it was just the first indicator of a larger problem. So the intent here is to test 250 to 300 deer from each DMAP area and monitor for the disease for five years. Now remember, CWD is difficult to detect and it starts off at very low levels. So it takes a concerted long-term monitoring to identify the issue. These are the 10 units we created for this season. Eight of them we are still monitoring from last season and two of them are new. You can get up to two antlerless per permits per unit and all of these units still have permits available. Now last year for the eight units we had, hunter participation was relatively good. Uh, we had um, all but one unit selling at least 50% or more of the available permits. We also exceeded our target sample size in four of the units. And in the units where we did not reach the 250 samples, we still had relatively good numbers and the samples from those units were still informative. And last we have the containment zones, which are the smallest area consisting of an approximately one mile radius buffer around the location of a new CWD detection. So the size is based on a deer's average home range, and it includes the individuals it was most likely to come in contact with and potentially infect. Now this area represents the best option to suppress the impact of that initial CWD detection. The goal within containment zones is to quickly remove those high-risk deer, so those that might have come in contact with the sick animal, before CWD has a chance to spread and become established on the land. Part of the process in these areas is to work with individual landowners to come up with the best strategies to accomplish this goal through increasing hunter harvest and or using targeted removals. Now for some of our management strategies, we already know that it is unlawful to remove or export high risk servid parts from a DMA or the established area. It is also unlawful to import those parts from any state or province outside Pennsylvania. That is new for this year. So for high risk parts, that would include the head, but more specifically the brain, eyes, lymph nodes, and tonsils, along with the spinal cord and the spleen. So these parts are considered high risk because those infectious prions concentrate in high densities in these locations. And the importance of these regulations is to prevent people from dumping high risk parts on the landscape in uninfected areas, possibly contaminating the soil in that area or exposing healthy deer or elk to the disease. Now, in terms of disposal of these parts, it is preferred that you dispose of them within your household trash, as that goes to a lime landfill. You can also leave them at the harvest site, 
although it's not preferred to leave them on the landscape since that can contribute to the environmental contamination, but if at all possible, at least try to bury them if you do that. We do have dumpsters available in the established area for disposal as well. These used to be available throughout all DMAs, but we recently had to make the change to providing them in the established area only. So you can find uh, those locations online as well. Now I've mentioned reducing deer numbers to slow the rate of disease transmission and to remove diseased individuals from the landscape. So how exactly do we go about doing that? The best way is to increase hunter harvest, and then in very specific situations, use targeted removal. So we can increase the antlerless harvest at the wildlife management unit scale, of course, through the antlerless license allocations, or at a smaller scale using those DMAP permits in the enhanced surveillance. Concurrent firearm seasons also give hunters more flexibility to use those opportunities. And successful management of CWD simply cannot occur without hunters. Their cooperation is essential, and removing those barriers to participation, like limited time to hunt, is one way we can do this. Now, as I said, targeted removals are an option, but it's only in certain areas with specific objectives. So these are very small scale operations carried out by wildlife professionals from USDA Wildlife Services and they only occur post hunting season. These efforts are heavily dependent on landowner participation because the removals will only occur on properties where access has been permitted. But the real key to CWD management is for hunters to harvest deer. Whether it's in a DMA or a CWD DMAP area or the established area and submit those deer for testing. Hunters can submit their deer head in one of these head collection bins provided by the Game Commission for free testing. And these bins can be found within DMAs and their locations can be found on our website. When you do submit a head, be sure to double bag it and keep the harvest tag attached to the ear. Also make sure that tag is completely and legibly filled out. If you do harvest a buck, we actually encourage you to remove the antlers because sometimes it won't fit down that chute with the antlers still attached. Hunters will receive a postcard notifying them that their sample has been submitted to the lab. You can then check the Game Commission website or you can call the CWD hotline number on the screen to get your results. Last year, turnaround time was approximately two weeks for hunters to get their results. Now those samples are critical in determining where CWD exists and to what extent. And that information helps us determine which management actions are appropriate. And for those of you that harvest a deer outside a DMA and want to get it tested, you can submit it for testing on your own, although there is a fee. And you can find out information for that on the Pennsylvania Animal Diagnostic Laboratory Services website, or you can call any of the labs for questions on submission. And to help the public stay current with our sampling efforts, we have a new dashboard and you can access it from our main CWD page under CWD test results and surveillance data. So it allows you to see our most up-to-date sampling data. It consists of three different pages. So there's samples over time, sample prevalence, and sample statistics. And this sample prevalence page that you see here contains a series of filters and maps to provide information at different scales. We also actually worked with Pennsylvania Department of Ag to develop one showing information for the captive industry. And that's also available. Um, that one is on the Department of Ag's website. Now, I hope this has given you a better understanding of CWD and everything the Game Commission is doing to combat it. Because the history of this disease around the country tells us if we don't fight this public threat, the outcomes are predictable. 
CWD infections will increase, affecting more deer and potentially hunting opportunities as well. If this pattern continues in Pennsylvania, what can we expect next year? Five years from now, 10, 20, even 50 years from now, limiting exposure of humans, other species, plants, agriculture, habitat to a disease with so many unknowns is critical. We know CWD is a serious threat to a cherished public resource. And the Game Commission is here to address that threat for the benefit of the public today and into the future. So thank you all. Thank you, Andrea, appreciate that. Excellent information uh, on what the Game Commission is doing on CWD. And so, uh, it's that time where we're going to answer your questions. We'll go up to 8.30. We'll try to get most of them answered. Some of them were answered throughout the presentation or got answered after people asked them. So we may breeze through those. So just bear with me here. Um, and so we'll go through these quickly. Uh, question, what is the typical time between CWD infection and mortality for deer? Uh, I can answer that. It varies. Uh, but deer can carry CWD for up to two years or maybe even longer than that before they get clinical symptoms. So uh, just like people, every deer is different, but we tell people it could be up to two years before you see that. Um, will the Game Commission test deer for CWD uh, that are harvested outside of a, um, a DMA? Uh, I think Andrea just answered that. Do you want to answer that again, Andrea? Yeah, so we do test statewide. Um including clinical suspects, but also hunter harvested deer, we do go to processors throughout the state and randomly sample. Just because you take a deer to one of our processors does not mean it's going to be tested. So don't think that's a guarantee, but we do at least collect those samples statewide. Okay, thank you. Uh, will this be available after the view? The answer to that is yes, this is all being recorded. So we will make a link available. Um, how is research for earlier testing of CWD being funded? I think uh, the question is, how, I, think, I think you're asking is how was this funded before? Uh, so state wildlife agencies have had to bear the brunt of the cost of this, frankly, primarily been state wildlife agencies, which means they have to rob from other programs in order to pay for CWD sampling. Uh, so that's the general answer to that one. Uh, I, either the other two of you want to add to that or is that good for you? I mean, there's starting to be more and more grants available as well, knowing how serious a problem it is, too. Okay. Is the meat safe to eat? And uh, how good, do you make to mention, too, in an early? Go ahead, Kim. In the early years, there was a lot of federal funding. 20 years ago, there was a lot of federal funding for this, so there wasn't as much of a burden on state agencies, which is important for hunters to know. And kind of as soon as they realize that it's probably not going to affect humans, you know, it was about 20 million a year that the, the federal government gave to state wildlife agencies to monitor it. That dried up very quickly. So uh, this full burden has been put on the state wildlife agencies for about the last 15 years. So it's nice that there are, you know, efforts to try to get additional funding sources because uh, the Game Commission in Pennsylvania and, and other state wildlife agencies should not have to shoulder this whole burden. Okay. Thank you, Kip. Is the meat safe to eat and how do you protect yourself? So the, the way to protect yourself is to make sure you get your deer sampled uh, and then find out if that deer is positive. Now, if the deer is positive, uh, the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that you do not eat that deer. So that is the best way to protect yourself is to not eat them, get them tested. Okay, moving right along here. Uh, this is a tough one, and I get it. If mature bucks are more likely to contract CWD, why wouldn't killing them be encouraged to take them out of the group? PA has done such an envious effort to preserve young bucks. It's a shame to recommend to take the ones that have been avoided for the last several years. And so, yes, that is one of the challenges here is that mature deer or mature bucks in particular can be a little bit more susceptible. Uh, that's not to say that does aren't either. Uh, but bucks certainly can be. And so, uh, yeah, I recommend killing them. I think everybody wants to. The mature ones are a lot harder to get. So it's one thing to say, hey, let's all go get the mature bucks. And we'd all sign up for that. Uh, but it's easier said than done. Um, but uh, I'll let uh, Kip or Andrea take a stab at this as well. Kip, you want to add to that? 
Sure. Uh, I think you did a good job with that, Nick. And and that's right. You know, we know that mature bucks are about twice as likely as mature does. But remember, you know, in almost every case, there's more than twice as many mature does as there are mature bucks in a population. So if you take a look at the number of actual CWD positive animals in an area, it's almost always more adult does that have it than adult bucks. So uh, in a real, you know, or in an ideal world, yeah, if you're in a disease zone, we could kill more bucks and kill more does. Uh, the reality of it is in Pennsylvania, remember, we already kill more bucks per square mile than almost every state, and we kill almost more does than every other state. So it's one of the challenges that the Game Commission has here is encouraging hunters to just continue to harvest at an even higher rate than they are now. So one of the things from the buck side, we do know that if you have some older bucks, it encourages people to, to stay afield longer and continue to harvest more antlerless deer. So, so uh, it's a balancing act that the Game Commission has to play to, to be able to achieve the necessary harvest. But uh, feel safe to know here in Pennsylvania, you know, everybody watching this tonight, we definitely can help by shooting some more uh, antlerless deer. So uh, it'd be a good goal for everybody here uh, for this upcoming season. So, and just to add to that, um, you know, we did consider removing antler point restrictions to increase the antler harvest. Um, we looked at what some other states have done, what some models have suggested, and actually our antlered harvest either meets or exceeds the target of other states. Um, so our antlered harvest, like you guys have said, is crazy. Um, so right now, we don't really need, we're already harvesting them at what that target level would be based on those other states and models. We also know that to manage a deer population, you do it through the antlerless harvest. Whether you want to increase it or decrease it, that is through the antlerless harvest. And as we're suggesting, the, the best management strategy available right now is to reduce deer populations in infected areas. And we know through deer management, the best way to do that is through the antlerless harvest. So right now, what we're focusing on is increasing those antlerless allocations and trying to get that population to start to come down in those infected areas. Okay, great answer, thank you. I don't know who's harvesting all these bucks, by the way, it's certainly not me. I'm also concerned about people depositing their heads in the bins with the antlers on. I can't <laughs> imagine ever doing that, but the fact that you've brought it up, Andrea, it tells me that somebody's tried it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, all right, let's continue on here. Um, and Andrea answered this one right toward the end of her presentation. What is CWD testing results turnaround time? And will hunters need to incur costs? Um, uh, hunters need to incur costs, assuming they use a processor, process the deer, only to find out at a later time that the deer should not be consumed if it tests positive. Yeah, that stinks if that happens, but it could happen. Uh, Andrea, you want to answer that again? Sure. So last year, the turnaround time averaged two weeks. Again, it depends on part of what part of the season it is. During rifle season, obviously, we get more samples. Um, so it could be a little longer. It really just depends. As far as incurring costs from a processor, what a lot of hunters have told me and what I would probably do is, you know, quarter up your deer and freeze it. Wait till you get your results back and then if it's good, take it to a processor. If it's not, then you wouldn't have wasted all of that time and money um, getting it processed. Okay. Uh, so is, is there any data on herd immunity within a CWD area? And as we said at the beginning, uh, there is no herd immunity, okay? This is a 100% fatal disease. Deer don't become immune to it. Uh, there are There is some data that suggests there are certain um, genetic variations of deer that are less susceptible possibly or would carry the disease less, but none that show that deer are just resistant to getting CWD. And, uh, and either of you two want to add to that, feel free. I think that covers it. Okay. I'm gonna make sure I'm covering all the bases here. Uh, okay, let's see here. Um, Knowing the fact that deer farms are the center of transmitting CWD in Pennsylvania, why does the Department of Agriculture not close down all deer farms? Uh, so the first thing I'll say is I don't, we can't say that it's a fact that deer farms are the center of transmitting CWD. As we said, CWD exists in the wild herd, it exists in captive herds, and we know that moving deer is bad, period. And that's, that's a big part of it. 
uh, it is a fair question to ask, uh, you know, the role that deer farms play in all this. And I think we've clearly displayed that through looking at the maps and, and what we've said. Um, and so, yeah, it is the Department of Agriculture that, it, that it oversees this, but they, Department of Agriculture works for agriculture and deer farming is agriculture. So understand it's not an agency that would uh, be interested in closing down all deer farms. And so it is a challenge. And so if it's something you want to pursue or pursue or discuss further, talk to the Department of Agriculture, uh, talk to your local representatives and express your concerns there is what I would say. Uh, let's see here. Deer have been around for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. <laughs> uh, they've been around a long time. Um, what actually are prions and why is it a problem now? Where did it come from? Was it not around 20 years ago? Who would like the honor of taking that one? Uh, I can probably answer part of it in that it was around 20 years ago. It was actually first described in 1967. Nobody knows where it came from. Um, it was found initially uh, described in a captive research facility in Colorado. And then it was first detected in the wild in an elk again in Colorado in 1981. Um, but again, they don't really know. There's theories that maybe it kind of evolved from scraping and sheep because that is another prion disease. It could be that it spontaneously happened. Um, there's a lot of theories out there, but nobody actually knows for sure. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just clicking through these to make sure I'm tracking. Uh, this is a good one. Is there some type of national or states consolidated plan to attack this? Uh, need the resourcing because current plans do nothing more than uh, attempt to slow the rate. Uh, I'll answer part of this, Mark, and say that yes, uh, the, the uh, Association for Fish and Wildlife Agencies is a group that uh, helps coalesce states on various issues, various wildlife management issues, fish and wildlife management issues around the country. They have completed a document that has the recommended best management practices that they've agreed on uh, as, a, as a group, which I think is good. So yes, nationally, states talk to each other very closely and they are uh, very much working together and on the same page on, on best management practices for this. Uh, further in Pennsylvania, you do have a, a very good and recently completed uh, a response plan for CWD. And Andrea, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so in terms of, you know, working with other states and everything, we do talk with, you know, especially our neighboring states, let each other know what's going on. Um, but again, it's handled individually by each state agency and each state has different funding and resources available. So we can't necessarily all do the ideal management. Um, and right now, slowing the spread really is the only management. Um, there is no, once it becomes established, getting rid of it. It's trying to keep it from spreading to more parts of the state. Um, so unfortunately, even with all the cooperation we have, you still aren't going to completely get rid of it. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I'm going to, this will be our last one because it's 830 and I apologize if we didn't get to all of them. I think we got, if we didn't get to you, we probably answered it in the presentation, but this is a really good one. Any concerns with the taxidermy mount of a deer head with CWD given high risk parts are removed as part of the taxidermy process? Okay, so a couple things to unpack with this one. If you shoot a, a deer that you would like to have mounted in a CWD management area, you still cannot take that whole head out with you. Okay, I want to be clear about that. If, if your taxidermist is not in the disease management area, what you can do is you can cape the deer or have a taxidermist in the disease management area cape the deer for you, and you can then take the antlers and a clean skull plate with the cape to your taxidermist. So I want to make that clear. Just because you want to get a deer mounted doesn't mean that you can take it from where you shot it in a disease area to a place that's outside the disease area. So there's that part of it. Uh, the other part of it is taxidermists are participating by helping to provide samples of deer they're mounting. So that's very helpful. And uh, there's been, there's been a lot of guidance provided to them on proper disposal, stuff they should have been following anyway, hopefully, 
um, proper proper disposal of parts from deer that they are doing taxidermy on. So for example, if you have a taxidermist in a disease management area, uh, they should be properly dealing with those parts in landfills or other approved ways. So uh, Andrea, do you want to add to that? Or Kip, as a, as a taxidermist yourself, do you want to talk about that at all? I think you about, oh, that, you know, that's a big help the taxidermists right. can provide. Uh, I think, Nick, I'll add that taxidermists can play a big role in this from a sampling end, but then also it's imperative that they are disposing of all of those materials appropriately. Because as we said, you know, the high risk parts are there. So we have seen examples in other states where tax numbers have just dumped these out in the landscape. That's a terrible recipe for then exposing other wild deer to this. So from the tax numbers end, you know, it's safe for people to take them there. Tax numbers then can remove those parts um, and then make sure that they are disposed of in the landfill so that they are not sharing any of these out on the landscape. And hey, Nick, you know, one thing we should mention as a resource for folks before we go is, uh, is the new uh, approved uh, or a CWD layer that we have on Onyx. For years, we've had that where folks can go in and see all the CWD positive counties. Um, brand new this fall, we've worked with the Pennsylvania Game Commission and, and the other 25 states that have the disease to include additional information for users, such as what exactly are the boundaries of that disease management area, where they can go to get deer tested, if they even have to have them tested, movement regulations, you know, there's so much more information that makes it helpful for hunters, both within here in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, that uh, great free resource for folks uh, if they have that app that uh, can be way more helpful than, uh, than anything else that we've had out there in the past. So uh, something great that they can go and, and help themselves while they're afield this fall. Yeah. All right, everybody, I do appreciate, uh, all of us appreciate you being here this evening for this. We had a great turnout. Um, I wanna mention too, if we didn't get to your question, email us, we'll get back to you. Uh, this, is, this is a National Deer Association event here and we were thankful that the Game Commission was able to join us. Thank you, Andrea, for, for coming in and giving us the PGC's perspective. And so initially, if you would direct your emails to uh, Kip or I, it's, mine is just nick at deerassociation.com and Kip is kip at deerassociation.com. And if there are game commission specific uh, questions that you need answered, uh, Andrea, are, are you able to provide an email address for that? Yeah, if you saw on my very last slide, I had the CWD hotline phone number, or we do have a CWD email as well, and that is just info cwd at pa.gov. Okay, thank you. So we can get your questions answered if you reach out to those places. And again, thank you for being here. I recognize it's uh, not a fun subject, but it's an important subject, and we're glad you were here, and we're glad we could give you some information. So with that, Good luck to everybody who's going to be hunting this fall, and uh, we look forward to bringing you additional information sometime down the road. So thank you. Good night.